to Fresh Image Presents. We're at the midway point of this Lenten season, and if we've really decided to challenge ourselves this Lent to grow in holiness and virtue, perhaps some of what we've decided to give up or take on is becoming a bit taxing. And this is a good thing. It means we're really making an effort to grow closer to God and become the people we have been created to be. But it also means that we could probably use a little reminder of why we're doing all of this and some encouragement too, to help us along the way. This is exactly what we hope to offer you in this Fresh Image Presents, learning asceticism from the Desert Fathers and Mothers. Friends, as we arrive at the midway point of the Lenten season, it is a good time to remind ourselves of the why of Lent. Why does the church call us to increase attention and devotion to the practices of fasting, almsgiving, and prayer? Why exactly have I decided not to have chocolate, coffee, or participate in social media for these 40 days? Or, why have I committed myself to spending more time with scripture or making sure I pray the rosary daily? It is human nature to require reasons for carrying out action, especially actions that require increased effort, and if we don't have a why, We are likely to abandon those actions which tax our bodily, psychological, and spiritual resources. The season of Lent is often described as a penitential season, and so it is. This was the message we heard from the prophet Joel on Ash Wednesday. Even now, says the Lord, return to me with your whole heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your hearts, not your garments, and return to the Lord, your God. Then, in our Gospel reading from Matthew, we heard the Lord give us the practices that would enact this rending of our hearts in repentance, fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. With this aim and these practices in hand, we then embarked on our penitential journey by being marked with ashes, the priest placing ashes upon our heads with the words, Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return, or simply, Repent and believe the Gospel. All of this makes clear that the season of Lent is, indeed, a season of repentance carried out through penitential practices. But if we leave it here and go no further, what does our why for doing all this become? Let us recall that repentance is is derived from the Latin penetere, meaning to be penitent. St. Thomas Aquinas counts penitentia, penance, among the virtues, defining it as grief for past sins with the intention of removing them. We will see that grief is central to the teachings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, but important here is that together with grief, Aquinas defines penance as a virtue that desires the removal of our past sins. Of course, Aquinas already has in mind the sacrament of penance, and he names the virtue of penance as the matter of the sacrament itself. But he has something else in mind as well. You see, sin for Aquinas and for the great tradition is not just wrong action or actions, although sin manifests itself in this way. Neither is sin most properly a weight or burden upon the soul, although it certainly can feel this way. Rather, sin is something much more insidious, more deadly. Sin is most properly thought of as a disease of the soul that is at once necrotizing and tumorous. That is, it both eats away at the soul, and if left untreated, forms abnormal growths in the soul. These abnormal growths are known as vices, which make us tend to repeatedly act in sinful ways. Thus, when Aquinas speaks of the intention to remove sin, he has in mind both the absolution of sin in the sacrament of penance, and the replacing of the vices of the soul with virtues, which is why he tells us that penance comprises things pertaining to all the virtues. Thus, during the season of Lent, we are simultaneously apt after the abolition of sin in our lives and growth in virtue with the help of God's grace. This is precisely the dynamic explicitly stated in Lenten Preface 4 of the Eucharistic Prayers. For through bodily fasting you restrain our faults, raise up our minds, and bestow both virtue and its rewards through Christ our Lord. Consequently, I would suggest that the season of Lent is properly understood not only as a penitential season, but as an ascetical season. The word asceticism comes from the Greek eschesis, meaning exercise, training, or practice. That Lent in its nature is ascetic 
is most clearly seen in the church's call to us during this time to focus more intensely on fasting, almsgiving, and prayer. These are the practices that the church as mother and teacher calls us to in order to leave sin behind and grow in virtue. In this, the church is quite literally our coach or trainer in the Christian life. Much as a coach or trainer puts athletes through a series of exercises in order to be able to perform at the very peak of their potential. For Christians, the peak is holiness, perfect conformity to and participation in the life of Christ. This is our salvation. What role, then, do the desert fathers and mothers play in all this? Well, they are some of the most well-trained athletes that the Christian life has ever seen. Just as a young aspiring athlete desires nothing more than to become like their athletic heroes, there's a reason I want to be like Mike as a song. So too, we as Christians ought to aspire to become like the heroes of the Christian life. And how do young aspiring athletes athletes become more like the greats? Athletes become great not by simply practicing skills on their own, not by shooting baskets in an empty gym or throwing a football around an open field. Athletes become great by getting on the field or court and competing with those who are better than them and by testing their skills against theirs. By doing this, the lesser athlete witnesses the movements, the skills, the know-how of the greats. This is where the desert fathers and mothers play an indispensable role in our lives. And by exposing ourselves to them, we witness the peak performance of the life of the gospel put into action. To use the athletic metaphor again, just how out of shape we physically are would become acutely apparent were we to step on the field with professional athletes. In the same way, when we place before our eyes the lives of the desert fathers and mothers, it becomes painfully obvious how out of shape we are spiritually. After all, it is the intensity of their spiritual practices that these great Christian heroes are best known for. Often we think of them as fleeing from society and putting their bodies through intense self-discipline. For example, Abba Daniel said about Abba Arsenius, He lived with us many a long year, and every year we used to take him only one basket of bread. And when we went to find him the next year, we would eat some of that bread. We also hear that the same Abba Arsenius used to say that one hour's sleep is enough for a monk if he is a good fighter. Abba Bessarion once told some monks, For fourteen days and nights I have stood upright in the midst of thorn bushes without sleeping. To this we could add practices such as sleeping on the ground as Amma Syncletica, or refusing ever to eat meat as Abba Poemen. Yet to recount all of this is to say nothing of the why we are looking for. Thankfully, they spell it out very clearly for us. You see... The desert fathers and mothers weren't simply living this way to check off some boxes. Fasting, check. No sleep, check. Standing in a thorn bush, check. As if simply doing these actions would be of benefit to them. Nothing could be further from the truth. Rather, each and every single one of these practices was aimed in one direction. Salvific unity with Jesus Christ. For example, we see Abba Apollo beginning his days joyfully by saying, I am going to work with Christ today for the salvation of my soul, for that is the reward he gives. And Abba Isidore the priest teaches us, If you desire salvation, do everything that leads you to it. Thus, for the many of us who are still in the amateur stages of the spiritual life, it is, it is of the utmost importance that we do not take up ascetic practices such as fasting, thinking that we are accomplishing something simply by doing them. The last thing the desert fathers and mothers give us is a simple list of boxes to check that amounts to a simple formula for growing in holiness. Rather, everything we do must be done for the sake of union with Christ. There is no other reason for doing any of this. This leads to a word of caution for those who choose to pick up the apothegmata, that is, the sayings of the Desert Fathers. While these verbal and exemplary teachings are passed down to us all, it is of the utmost importance that we remember that originally, each teaching was given to specific individuals. Just as a trainer or a coach tailors their instruction to a specific athlete, 
The Desert Fathers and Mothers tailored their teachings specifically to the individual or individuals to whom they were speaking. In a great, and in a great many instances, people whom they shared their lives with in a master and disciple relationship. In her writing on the Desert Fathers and Mothers, religious sister and theologian Benedicta Ward highlights that while the key phrase of the apothegmata is, Speak a word, Father, the word that was sought was not a theological explanation, nor was it counseling, nor any kind of dialogue in which one argued a point. It was a word that was part of a relationship, a word which would give life to the disciple if it were received. The Abbas were not spiritual directors in the late Western sense. They were fathers to the sons whom they begot in Christ, and the teachings they gave to individual students consisted of a spirituality which was not taught, but caught. This has a twofold implication for us. First, In reading the sayings, we must take caution before attempting anything like what we see and hear. And second, it is imperative that we seek out and find such relationships for ourselves with people who are more advanced than ourselves in the Christian life, people who we can be accountable to and receive advice from. That said, there are many general teachings and practices in the sayings that we can all benefit from. Here I will highlight four which should give us more than enough to work on for the rest of Lent, and which should also help us help give us the means of persevering in our ascetic journey to the end. The first relates to the first part of Aquinas' definition of penance above, grief for past sins. In the sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers, mourning and weeping plays a very prominent role. In fact, over time, so identified had the desert ascetics become with mourning and weeping, that the Jesuit patristic and monastic scholar Father Irenae Hauscher writes that in some places the monks were named for the very word of the second beatitude, Blessed are those who mourn. The word used in Matthew 5.4 is the Greek benthuntes, which comes from the word benthos, which means simply mourning, and which we might translate as compunction. Within this context, Father Hauscher defines penthos as mourning for salvation lost, a mourning which must be perpetual, just as we must perpetually work out our salvation. In a great display of the virtue of penance, the desert fathers and mothers wept intensely for their sins. We find that it was said of Abba Arsenius that he had a hollow in his chest channeled out by the tears which fell from his eyes all his life while he sat at his manual work. When another desert father, Abba Abba Poemon, learned that Arsenius had died, he exclaimed, Truly you are blessed, Abba Arsenius, for you wept for yourself in this world. He who does not weep for himself here below will weep eternally hereafter, so it is impossible not to weep. When is the last time we wept out of remorse for our sins? And if we don't, we might ask ourselves, why not? So central a part of, the, of Christian asceticism was weeping for one's sins that Abba Poeman taught, He who wishes to purify his faults purifies them with tears, and he who wishes to acquire virtues acquires them with tears. For weeping is the way the scriptures and our fathers give us when they say, Weep. Truly, there is no other way than this. Of course, This is not a forced crying or crocodile tears as if shedding a tear were itself meritorious or efficacious. The point is rather that the compunction these figures had for their sins was so great they could not help but mourn. And as we see, for Abba Poeman, mourning and the pursuit of virtue went hand in hand in the ascetic life, and this leads us to consider why they carried out such seemingly odd practices. Here we might mention a virtue that we don't hear spoken of much, but that are that is especially pertinent for us today, the virtue of vigilance. The cultivation of vigilance was the reason why the ascetic, the desert ascetics, went such long stretches without sleep and carried out extended periods of intense fasting. Thus, when someone asked Abba Agathon, which is better, bodily asceticism or interior vigilance, Agathon replied, "Man is like a tree." Bodily asceticism is the foliage, interior vigilance is the fruit. 
But what does being vigilant mean? Abba John gave, gave this advice. Watching means to sit in the cell and be always mindful of God. That is what is meant by, I was on the watch and God came to me. Thus, to be vigilant is to be continually aware, aware of God's activity in our lives both interiorly and exteriorly. However, the cultivation of vigilance does not have its end in simply sitting in our rooms in silence or forcing ourselves to stay up all night. That is how this virtue is cultivated. Its aim, rather, is the ability to be continually aware of all that might harm our relationship with God or our neighbor in our day-to-day lives and to remove ourselves from those situations that are the near occasion of sin and vice. Abba Isidore exemplifies what it means to live this virtue in an episode he recalls for us from his own life. One day I went to the marketplace to sell some goods. When I saw anger approaching me, I left things and fled. Notice that the practice of fasting cultivates this virtue within us quite naturally. For if we are engaged in serious fasting... We feel our hunger acutely, and we are hyper-aware of how even the glimpse or smell of food becomes a temptation to break the fast. Vigilance is also cultivated through another practice, that of silence. Silence was a practice of the desert ascetics in two distinct but interrelated ways. The first was simply the silence meant for prayer. Together with the cultivation of vigilance, this was what the monks were doing up all night seeking to establish a perpetual dialogue with God that would permeate the whole of their lives. Thus we hear them speak much of the effort to pray without ceasing, as the Apostle Paul exhorts us to in his first letter to the Thessalonians, even in the midst of their daily labors. If taking some time to pray in the silence of our rooms, as the Lord recommends to us, is not currently part of our daily Lenten routine, we should consider making it so. We do not have to think about our daily routine long to realize that we are continually inundated with noise. Our phones are constantly alerting us to a phone call, text, or email, and this tool we carry in our pockets gives us immediate access to thousands of hours of music and podcasts. If we do not have interior silence amidst all this noise, our efforts to continually grow in union with God through conformity to the life of Christ will be frustrated. The second way the desert fathers and mothers advise us to practice silence is in our interactions with others. We might think of this silence as vigilance in speech. This is a teaching often repeated by these great Christian exemplars, but Abba Basarion gets right to the heart of it when he teaches us, keep silence and do not compare yourself with others. There are two issues to tease out here. The first is that given today's technology, we have the ability to speak verbally or textually to one another, even people we don't know, literally on demand and at our fingertips. Anyone who has been on social media for a few minutes knows that this ability often results in a proclivity to become nasty with one another, to say things we would never say to another's face, and to make accusations that we have no basis or proof for whether it be with respect to someone famous or someone we know personally. Thus, the desert fathers and mothers would suggest to us that we practice silence to avoid these dangers, which do damage to others and to our own selves as well. But the quote from Abba Basarion also draws out another virtue of the ascetic life emphasized in the sayings, that is, detachment. We see this in his telling us not to compare ourselves with others, This is a virtue especially important for us to cultivate in a hyper-materialistic culture where the people who are most admired are often those who simply have the most stuff or who are the most popular. What this often leads to is what Abba Bessarion is cautioning against, the vices of greed and avarice, the desire to have what others have simply because they have them and we don't. We see a radical form of detachment exemplified by Abba Macarius. It is said that one day, Abba Macarius discovered a man who owned a beast of burden engaged in plundering Macarius' goods. So he came up to the thief as if he was a stranger, and he helped him to load the animal. He saw him off in great peace of soul, saying, We have brought nothing into this world, and we cannot take anything out of the world. 
Detachment also lies behind the repeated cautioning in the sayings against elitism. The Desert Fathers and Mothers caution us against spending time with people simply because they are somebody to the world, or because by hanging around them, we think we become more important ourselves. For example, someone clearly plagued by an elitist mentality is said to have asked Abba Arsenius, How is it that we, with all our education and wide knowledge, get nowhere? while these Egyptian peasants acquire so many virtues. Abba Arsenius replied, We indeed get nothing from our secular education, but these Egyptian peasants acquire the virtues by hard work. And so it is with the Christian life of asceticism. It is nothing if not hard work. The ascetical practices and virtues that have been mentioned are meant to cultivate all of the virtues that make up participation in the life of Christ obedience, humility, and self-control being especially highlighted by the sayings. This is our why. This is our salvation. Moreover, this quick tour of what the sayings of the Desert Fathers and Mothers has to teach us should come with two additional provisos with which we might conclude. First, leaving sin and vice behind is not only hard work, it is work that lasts a lifetime. A monk once came to Abba, the- Abba Theodore seeking advice for the persistent struggles he faced in the ascetic life. And Abba Theodore asked him, Tell me how many years you have worn the habit. The monk replied, For eight years. Abba Theodore responded, I have worn the habit seventy years, and on no day have I found peace. Do you expect to obtain peace in eight years? We are told that at these words the brother went away strengthened. Engaging with the lives of the desert fathers and mothers should strengthen us as well. For although it is clear that they had advanced in the Christian life far beyond where many of us currently are, they remind us of what a life totally committed to God and open to the grace of the Holy Spirit looks like and is capable of. Yet to sustain such activity requires prudent discernment regarding our current state, which is the second closing proviso. Here, by way of conclusion, the words of another ascetic, Evagrius of Pontus, are helpful. In his admonition on prayer, Evagrius taught, It is better to begin from one's feeble state and end up strong, to progress from small things to big, than to set your heart from the very first on the perfect way of life, only to have to abandon it later, or keep it solely out of habit because of what others will think, in which case all this labor will be in vain. He continues, Choose a way of life that suits your feeble state. Travel on that, and you will live. For your Lord is merciful, and he will receive you, not because of your achievements, but because of your intention. Thanks Thanks for for listening. listening. If you enjoyed this, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And visit our website, freshimage.org, to become a Fresh Image Insider and have our latest resources delivered directly to your inbox. Until next time, this is Fresh Image, reminding you that you were created to live life to its fullest. So that you might be a breath of God's fresh, life-giving air to the world.